that you see in your bulletin. We're actually going to be reading from John chapter 8, starting with the second verse. John 8, second verse. Let us begin with a prayer. Lord, as we come to read your word this morning, we ask that you would illumine our hearts and minds by the power of your spirit, that we might understand your word, and that we might be doers as well as hearers of it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. John chapter 8, starting with the second verse. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded that, that such should be stunned. But what do you say? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. Let us pray. I've already prayed, Lord. <laughs> and thank you for your prayer. Bless me. Name we pray. Amen. First sign of the movie. <laughs> on the radio back in the 90s, uh, there was a character on the radio whose name was Roy Mercer. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him. Anybody ever heard of Roy Mercer? But uh, he would call up some business as a prank call and would make some outrageous claim as to how they had done him wrong. And then he would make an outrageous claim on money they were supposed to pay him. Uh, for instance, he might say, call up a movie theater and say, we went to a movie last night and my wife got some popcorn and it was bad popcorn and she got sick and threw up at the roller rink afterwards and the people behind us fell and, and ripped their clothes and broke their leg and you're going to have to pay me $500 to make it right. And of course the person would have nothing to do with that. And by the end, they were so mad that in almost every case, they were ready to fight. You know, his kind of banner question was, well, how big a fella are you? I'll just come down there and whoop you. And the people's answer would almost always be, well, you just come right on. Uh, they had no idea who Roy Mercer was, how big he was, or you know, he could have been a psychopath with a chainsaw. They didn't know. But they were so mad, and I guess their pride so offended by what he was saying, that they were ready to start a fight, you know, without even knowing who he is. There's an old saying, you know, don't ever let your mouth write a check that the rest of you can't cash. And uh, that's kind of what they were doing. And that's the way we see the Pharisees in today's scripture. Uh, their pride that they had, their self-righteousness and arrogance, uh, made them think that they could entrap Jesus. And instead they found out they were trying to cash a check that they theologically couldn't cash. In this passage, Jesus has gone to the temple to teach. Now the temple was considered to be the very home of God. And for Jesus to be teaching there uh, meant that he was at the center of where their faith was and is. As he was teaching there, uh, a group of Pharisees and religious lawyers called scribes came through and uh, were bringing with them a woman. Now the Pharisees were known to be kind of the religious people of their day. They were known to know the scripture by heart. Uh, they were the ones that everyone considered the pious ones. Uh, and so they were the ones that even people didn't like them very much, they looked up to as the really religious folks uh, in uh, that time and place. But here we see they are playing such a game in the very house of God in what an abomination that is. <coughs> they come bringing this woman. No doubt she's disheveled, maybe crying. And they bring her to the very house of God, to the temple, and drop her before the crowd and before Jesus and say, we have caught this woman in the very act of adultery. There's no doubt that she is guilty. Now we know that Moses in the law says she must be stoned to death. What is it that you say? Well, the question was really kind of a trap because they figured that if Jesus answered Yes, stoner. Then they could turn to the crowd and say, well, Jesus talks a lot about love, doesn't he? But he's not very loving if he wants to stone this woman. And then they could go to the Romans and say, this man is trying to get us to kill this woman, and that is only the Romans' prerogative, and maybe they would arrest Jesus. If, on the other hand, Jesus said, don't stone her, then they could have turned to the crowd and said, 
This man's a heretic. He doesn't even believe in God's law. Thinks he knows better. Why are you listening to him? And the crowds would leave and they could get rid of him that way. Here you have these very religious folks who are playing a game with this woman's very life. I probably assume they probably don't even really care about this woman or what she's done. Their main purpose is to trap Jesus. And they probably even think maybe they're doing God's will in doing so. But here they are playing games before God and everybody in God's very house simply to try to trap Jesus. And so they ask Jesus, well, what do you say we should do with her? And Jesus, as is usual, does the very unusual. He doesn't answer them directly. He just sends, kneels down and begins to write with his finger in the dust. Now, we don't know what he was writing there. Some people have conjectured that he was maybe writing the sins of those Pharisees that deserved to be stoned to death uh, so that they would see and know in their hearts that they maybe deserved it as much as this lady may have. Or they could have been writing the names of the men in the crowd who had maybe been with that lady uh, and so deserved to be there as well. Because that's kind of a central question here. They bring this lady who they caught, they say, in the very act of adultery. If they bring her, where's the guy? He should be there too. The fact that he's not there probably leads us to speculate that this is simply the way they have come to interpret the law. That only the woman can be guilty. The guy is not. And that's an abomination. That's directly against what the law says. But that's the way sometimes people are with God's law when they try to interpret it. They interpret it to their benefit and to everybody else's detriment. You know, they're good at pointing fingers at everybody else and what they've done wrong, but they're not quite so good at looking at themselves. And so since these men were interpreting the law, uh, you know, it was the women who suffered. You often see that around the world today in a great many places, uh, particularly religious cults where you know, people are forced to dress a certain way. It's almost always the women who have the worst of how they have to dress. You see the guys come around, they look just like everybody else. Well, they, they asked Jesus about this stoning, and writing in the dust, he doesn't answer. And so they begin to push him. Well, Master, what do you say? And then Jesus stands up and he says something they weren't expecting. He doesn't say, yes, stone her, or no, don't stone her. He says, let those among you who are without sin cast the first stone at her. And then he kneels down and begins to write in the dust once again. Now this struck at their hearts. It was not the answer they were expecting. He did not say, Stoner or not stoner, just let one of you who's without sin throw the first stone. Now it says that many of them were convinced in their conscience, and they left at that point. But I can almost guarantee, knowing people, and we all know folks, that there were probably some in that crowd that probably thought they could still throw a stone. They probably thought that they were so special, and one of God's special children to the point that they could throw a stone. Uh, that their sins weren't really that bad, at least not as bad as this woman's sin and that they could do that. But they were also pretty politically savvy. And they knew that if they tried that, there everybody would look at them and say, well, look at that hypocrite, you know, thinking they could throw us down. And so in the end, one by one by one, they all kind of go away and uh, leave the woman alone. Jesus at length looks up from writing in the dust and sees no one around him, and he says, woman, where are your, your, uh, those who have come to condemn you? Is there no one to condemn you? And she goes, no one, Lord. And so then Jesus gets to speak to her. Now Jesus is the one who can judge her. He is one who is without sin. He could cast the stone if he wants to. Notice that he doesn't act like she hasn't sinned. He doesn't wink at what she's done and act like it hasn't happened. He knows it's happened. But neither does he throw a stone, does he? What he says is, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The one who could judge, the one who could throw the stone, did not. Instead, he showed mercy and grace and love and gave this woman her life back so that she could go about her business. I think in the season of Lent, as we search our hearts, it's good for us to look at our hearts and see what it is we are about sinning. Sometimes we can have our lives so jam-packed full of stuff that we forget what is really important, what is central to us, and what is central to us as believers in Jesus Christ, both as churches and individuals. 
Uh, I don't usually like talking about myself up here, but I will mention myself this morning. I was probably a very different person 20 years ago or so. Um, probably not enough that you would notice on the street. I still was short, fat, and bald. But uh, I was a much harder person and much narrower and much more quick to point a finger. Uh, and then the time came when fingers could point at me. And you know, I wasn't guilty of this sin or, or anything like that. But it was a point of time when folks in church could have shown mercy and grace, but instead chose the opposite. And it was a time of crisis. It was at that point, with shoe on the other foot, that I realized that the church can either point fingers or it can reach out in love. And I decided at that point to reach out in love from there on. You know, I know right and wrong. You don't have to beat me over the head with that. And most people do know right from wrong. Uh, and if you tell them they're doing wrong, if they're ready to receive that, fine, but more than likely they'll just defend themselves even knowing they're wrong. But what people really need is the love of Christ. And that is what the church, and what we as believers can show them, is the love of Jesus Christ. They know what's wrong. You don't have to hit them over the head with the Bible. You don't have to be judgmental of them. God is the judge. We're not. Our job is to love people. And instead of pointing fingers at them, point fingers toward Jesus, who is the one who can save all, and who is the one that will forgive, and who will give what everybody uh, in their time needs. And so, if you were to ask me today, how big a fella are you? Uh, I'm still as big as I ever was. I hadn't lost any weight. But I'm probably a bit more humble than I used to be. And humility is a good thing, I think. And it's something that the Pharisees were sadly lacking. They had no humility. They thought they were good enough. They didn't see any need for a Savior. But maybe some of them came to a point in time, too, in their lives when they were the ones that people were pointing the finger at. And if they did, they would have found that the only thing that makes any difference is the love of God in that point. It's the only thing that can hold you together. It's the only thing that will pull you through. And it is enough. The love of God is powerful enough to pull you through. No matter what it is, no matter what situation you are in. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy which you pour out upon us. Help us all in our hearts to see that we are just like this woman in the passage. We are all sinful at some point, somehow, some way. We all reach points in our lives where we're maybe dead wrong. Sometimes we may be like the Pharisees where we're good at pointing fingers at others but not so much at ourselves. Lord, we know that you, in your grace, see all of this in our hearts. Help us to realize what is central to our lives as individuals and as a church, that we might be loving, that we might show your grace, that we might point at you so that others may see you and know you as well. And all this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.